Welcome to uh, the Tech Talk for bringing the power of the internet to the developing rural Africa. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Zerbuchen and uh, some of his students from the Space Mission Analysis Design class at the University of Michigan. And uh, Thomas is the Director of Entrepreneurial Studies at the College of Engineering uh, for the University of Michigan, as well as a professor in the Atmospheric and Oceanic Space Sciences Department. Thomas. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Well, we're really excited to be here. Uh, uh, of course, uh, many of you uh, come from Michigan. Uh, some of our best students are here. And uh, also, including Ryan and his colleagues, but also, I'm excited uh, to talk about uh, this project uh, because we did this with collaborators, collaborators from, uh, from this company. And uh, what I'd like to uh, talk to you is a vision, and a vision that has to do with addressing a major need uh, and that has to do with bringing internet to the world. If you look at the internet uh, distribution, uh, you're aware of these plots, of course. Uh, you see that it's very uneven. You have uh, areas. Uh, that are uh, covered very high. You have areas that are uh, there in the purple, but you have uh, one area that's really glaringly, obviously red here, and that's uh, Africa. Pretty much the entire continent of Africa is in, in the red uh, on this. Uh, on the average, of course, uh, of about 7 billion inhabitants, roughly one in seven have uh, basic access to internet, even though uh, much of that access is not as, uh, as uh, uh, good as we are used to uh, using it, of course. Uh, what we want to uh, talk about is not just uh, because of the technical aspect of, of uh, internet, but what we want to talk about is the impact this internet has. And there's ample case studies. You bring internet to the people, it empowers them. And uh, what you have, uh, for example, is this case study in Zambia where uh, uh, internet was introduced through uh, an organization, LinkNet, uh, a service focused on rural Zambia and Maka, a rural farming village where uh, corn is the primary crop, really got transformed by that. This local farmer learned around about sunflower farming via the internet, and just one year uh, later, he employs 10 full-time workers. You know, that's uh, what happens to uh, information. Once information gets to the right people, lives change. Another example uh, out of India, E. Copal uh, is uh, a distribution of uh, uh, internet kiosks that provide market information, cut out the middleman, and really provide uh, direct information about pricing of agri agricultural services and farming strategies all the way to the farmer, uh, affecting thousands and thousands of people and uh, really changing their lives uh, directly. So we're convinced that uh, if we show up uh, with internet, if, if internet is provided in Africa, important uh, uh, things are going to happen across the entire continent. The way uh, we did this, and what you're going to see is a presentation that uh, really is due to a lot of people, uh, something like 25 of them. Uh, all of them have different backgrounds, some of them more on the computer science side, some of them more on the aerospace engineering side. But really what we're trying to look at is that internet solution as a systems problem uh, with a lot of interactions uh, with uh, uh, industry contacts, uh, both in uh, space uh, type systems, which of course is one part of it, but also in, uh, of distributors on the ground. So uh, what you're going to see is a number of uh, people talking about this. And it's not going to be me. And in fact, I'm going to call up Joan Irwin right away, who has actually managed this uh, process in the uh, second half of the one-year project we did. So Joan, uh, coming up. Great. Thanks, Thomas. So as Thomas said, um, you know, we feel this is, is a global problem. So we, as a space systems design class, wanted to see how can we answer this from a space aspect. Um, so throughout this entire year, we took two approaches. The first being um, a global approach. And in that, we used a low Earth orbit to answer that question. So basically, a low Earth orbit means you're, you're not very high up, um, just about you know two to 400 kilometers up, probably more around 400. You're moving very quickly. You can orbit the Earth in a low Earth orbit in about an hour and a half. So what that means is if you want to have continuous coverage of the globe from that high up, you need to have a lot of satellites. This picture here just shows, you know, this I believe is the Iridium constellation of how many they require to have global coverage. Uh, so that was, that was pretty complex. So we took a step back and we said, all right, what if we have a focused region? Uh, what type of space solution would answer that? 
So we looked into the second half of the semester, we did a, a geostationary orbit, which means you're much further away, you're moving much slower, you're actually moving with the rotation of the Earth. So you see one point on the surface of the Earth at all times. So literally it takes you 24 hours to orbit the Earth one full day. So in doing this, we basically saw that a global solution is just too expensive. Uh, more specifically, this was our uh, design from last semester. Um, we had some pretty stringent coverage requirements, which drove this, the complexity of the system. But we required around 30, excuse me, 90 low Earth orbiting satellites. We had about 80,000 ground stations. As you can see in this picture, there were four different types of ground stations that were required um, in order to distribute this data correctly. And you know, it's, it's clearly very complex. It was very costly, about $2.4 billion. So while it was technically feasible, we found from a business standpoint, this just was not a feasible approach. So we took a step back and maintaining the vision that you know, we want a system that can be distributed in mass to small villages and tribes throughout the world. Who are those people and, and who needs that connectivity the most? Right now, ground infrastructure is being implemented all throughout the globe, but that obviously takes a lot of time. So as you can see in this plot here, Africa is, is the clear choice. Only 5% of its population has access to the internet, as opposed to 70% of the population in North America that does. Looking a little more closely into that, uh, as of 2006, the total African continent, the bandwidth that was available there was 28 gigabits per second. Now taking that down, what does that mean for everyday users? So the average university on the continent of Africa has the same bandwidth as an American household, yet it costs 50 times more to have that connectivity. All the users in New York City equal more than the entire continent of Africa. So that's pretty startling. Um, if you look in this figure here, um, these red lines focused around the coastal areas represent the fiber optic network that is currently being imp implemented across the continent and planned. So we see from this that it, you know, it's only focused on the, the coastal areas, which means it's being focused on the universities, the highly populated areas, the urban regions. If you also look on this plot, these green areas, this is a population density plot. So you can see these green areas represent the rural population of Africa. And they clearly are not being addressed today and are not going to be addressed in the future, as this also includes the planned fiber optic lines. So that to us drove home that we really want to focus on servicing these rural users. And that's just what we did. This is the design for our system this semester. Uh, it consists of a geostationary satellite, as I talked about earlier. Um, it has about 41,600 user stations that will be on the continent of Africa and four hub stations that will be placed off continent. Um, so they will have access to fiber capacity, as Drew will talk about. Now, the way this works is this hub station is connected to the internet backbone, transmits that signal up to the satellite, and then the satellite relays that back down to the user stations in Africa so they have connectivity to the internet. We'll be deploying this in a couple of phases. As it says here, we will initially service these areas via existing satellites over Africa. So we don't have to wait for you know, a geostationary satellite to be built, since that takes quite some time. Now, throughout this presentation, we have some highlights that we continue to focus on. The system is very low cost. It's implementable today. It's very low risk. And it's very easy to deploy. Now, it's low cost in that we minimize the cost of the user station in that the Africans can actually buy these user stations, you know, something like by obtaining a microloan and then spurring a business from that. Uh, we have a low upfront investment with our phase deployment, as I'll go into in a little bit. It's implemented today in that we're using existing technology. No huge improvements need to happen for the system to work. And, and that goes along with it being low risk as well. And then it's very easy to deploy. We wanted to make sure you know, these people in the middle of the desert or the rainforest, they, they don't have connection to power. So we actually have our own power system that is incorporated with our user station. So you can put these you know, in the middle of the desert, and it will run and work well. And they're very easy to set up so that you don't have to have technologically savvy people there to set these up for you. This is quickly just our phase deployment. I'll go into it a little detail later. But we will begin with leasing capacity from existing satellite. Uh, then we'll deploy six pilot programs, which we'll talk about in one minute, and then uh, make the decision to actually 
um, build our own geostationary satellite. From that, phase two will commence with the launching of that satellite. And then um, depending on you know, user adoption rates, et cetera, possibly launching a second satellite. Now, why do we want to have pilot programs? If you look at this figure right here, this is usually uh, commonly used to describe user adoption rates of businesses. So we have the early adopters in the beginning, like many of the people in this room are, and then we have the mainstream market. But you'll notice the gap here, or the chasm, as many people refer to it. So all businesses are required to cross this chasm in order for them to be very successful. So these pilot programs will allow us to understand and better characterize the user adoption rates, what drives them, um, what the user needs are, and then also gain support of non-governmental organizations that will help us cross this chasm. A little more specifically, these are uh, six locations that we suggest, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Niger, Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania. As you can see, they're spread throughout the continent. And these three categories are something we focused on, their power source, uh, their literacy rate, and the GDP, as we feel that um, Varying these three things will allow us to understand exactly what drives the user adoption rate, if it is just one. Looking a little closer, we see that you know, this city in South Africa is pretty dense, whereas in Kenya, we have a more widespread region. So this will just also help us to under understand the impacts of the demographics on adoption, et cetera. So now that you have a great idea of an overall view of how our system works, I'm going to pass it off to Kelly Moran, who's going to talk to you about the satellite portion of our system and how we're addressing that. All right, great. Thanks, Joan. So for our mission, the geostationary satellites are really the baseline for implementable internet access in Africa. Now, to, to develop such a system to service Africa, we looked into the current market and the different areas to decide where we should enter. So throughout this segment, I will discuss our marketing analysis and the trades based on leasing capacity off of currently existing assets versus contracting to build and operate another satellite. I will also discuss our propo proposed plan and implementation, which involves company collaboration along with our two-phase deployment strategy. So again, here's a quick look at our system architecture, as Joan just discussed. We have our geostationary satellite, which again is able to maintain its positioning over Africa. And again, it is um, communicating to the ground system. So initially, we will provide our services through currently operating satellites. And once we reach phase two, we will launch up to two satellites to achieve full capacity. So now, in order to develop such an architecture, we looked at the current market and basically the different areas. Um, this is an example of the satellite internet uh, value chain. And here we have three main areas. First, we have the satellite manufacturers, then the operators, and of course, the internet service providers, otherwise known as ISPs. Now, first, we look at the manufacturers. They, of course, build and launch the physical satellites based on the given requirements. Next, we have the satellite operators. Now, they purchase the manufactured satellite, and now they have the rights to the capacity aboard the satellite. So now they can either provide the services themselves, or they can lease the capacity to an ISP. Next, we have ISPs, which, for example, I'm sure many of you know of America Online. Um, we really don't want to end up like America Online. But this is just an example. Um, so an ISP of course, purchases the capacity from the satellite operators, and then they sell this service to its end users. So now that we've looked at the different areas, we ask ourselves, what is the most cost-effective and low-risk approach? So first, we look into ISPs. Now, what's beneficial about becoming an ISP is that, of course, the capacity is available now. We could immediately launch this system by leasing capacity off of the avail available um, satellites. Also, this is very efficient use of the capacity aboard a satellite. We won't have excess capacity, say, by launching a satellite right off the bat, where we might not use all this capacity. So the capacity that we purchase, we will use all of. Now, on the other hand, however, uh, this capacity is very limited in many areas, and also it's, it's very, very expensive. Um, for an entire mission, this would result in a cost on the order of billions of dollars. So this is not a cost-effective approach, of course, for providing service for our entire mission. 
Next, we look into becoming an operator of a satellite. So for example, if we were to purchase a satellite that was capable of providing 15 gigabits per second, this would result in a cost of $200 million. And it would take around two years to produce this satellite. So after looking at these two options, we've decided that becoming an operator would be the most cost-effective approach to our mission. So now how do we actually do this? What does it take to develop and deploy this system? So for phase one in regards to leasing capacity, we would purchase channels excuse me, from an operator such as Intelsat, and we would do so for about two and a half years. In regards to phase two, in order to develop what we need for phase two, we would work with a, a company such as Space Systems Laurel, or SSL, where they would manufacture our satellite. Now, in addition to having our sat satellite manufactured, we would have to work with one of SSL's partners to obtain orbital slots. Now, these slots are kind of like, kind of like um, real estate in space. So basically, we need to see which slots are available and which we can obtain the rights to. In addition to this, we, of course, need to acquire frequency. So similar to the spectrum over the United States, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with the recent um, spectrum auction that took place, the spectrum over Africa, of course, is regulated, so we would also need to obtain rights to the spectrum. In addition to this, we also need to obtain the landing rights for the individual countries. We need them to give us the go-ahead to project our data and our frequency down onto the individual countries. Now, also, throughout this development, we would work with a program such as Connect Africa or another NGO. We would work together um, to encourage our user adoption and increase um, overall interest in our system. Now here's an example of the type of design that we would like to use for our own satellites. This example is IPSTAR. IPSTAR is a highly capable satellite that's currently servicing Southeast Asia and Australia. Now one IPSTAR satellite is capable of providing a data rate of 45 gigabits per second. So based on our 30 gigabit per second requirement, this is clearly a feasible option. Now, the main thing I would like to point out about IP Star is its use of spot beam technology uh, combined with um, dynamic link assignment. So the traditional satellite uses broad or shaped beams to provide coverage to very wide regions or provide continental coverage. Now, IP Star uses mainly spot beams. These are satellite signals that are highly concentrated. In, the, in these concentrated signals, this allows the satellite to transmit several different types of data by using the same frequency. So the ability to reuse this frequency really, really makes for a very high efficient satellite. And so this is the type of design we would like to use for our own satellites. But our two individual satellites we would be using in phase two would have approxima approximately um, half the capacity of IP star. Well, this is the type of design we would use. Here's a quick look at our coverage uh, resulting from our phase deployment, beginning again with phase one, where we lease time from um, currently operating satellites. In red, you can see where we've launched our pilot station, pi ground station pilot programs, and the color depiction is, is an example of coverage that would be provided from Intelsat 10, which is listed as having available capacity. So this, of course, would allow testing of our pilot programs and allow them to expand. When we reach phase two, we launch, we launch our first geostationary satellite, this, of course, continues to provide coverage to the same regions where we've launched our pilot programs, allowing them to expand as well. And in addition to this, we would be providing three shaped beams, two to provide coverage to the lower population density desert regions, and another one to provide coverage until another satellite is needed. Finally, when additional service is required, we launch our second satellite, which will then provide coverage to the now higher density regions. So as a result, we have complete coverage of Africa. So here's a summary of our potential collaborators that would help us with this development. In regards to leasing capacity, we first have Inmarsat, which has global coverage through 11 operating satellites. Currently, the majority of their capacity has been contracted through all their distributors. However, in about a year, they will be renegotiating this distribution to allow for additional contracts. Next, we have Intelsat, which is the world's largest fixed satellite service provider. They, again, are listed currently as having available capacity over Africa. Next, for manufacturing our satellite, we have Space Systems Laurel, which actually produced IP Star, as I described earlier. 
Again, we would use them to manufacture our satellite, and the partners would help us to obtain our orbital, orbital slots and the spectrum that we require for our system. Again, we have um, a program such as Connect Africa, which is an information communica communication technology initiative that is basically focused on bringing companies together to provide affordable service to the rural regions of Africa. So we would join forces in expanding our pilot programs and encourage our user adoption. So in summary, the geostationary system is a very low risk and cost effective solution that has immediate implementation. Again, we're using the design based on IP star heritage and we'll be operating under phase deployment and collaboration which involves leasing capacity in phase one, and then launching up to two satellites when we reach phase two. Again, throughout this development, we, we would work with an NGO, again, to encourage user adoption and work together to increase interest in our systems. So now that we have an understanding of the geostationary element of our mission, I would like to introduce Drew Heckathorn to discuss the ground system. Thank you, Kelly. Um, it, first, just to revisit the system architecture slide that you guys have seen a couple times now. Um, I'm going to talk about the ground stations in particular, and we've got four hub stations that are located off-continent, um, mostly in Europe, and then uh, for, about 41,600 individual user stations. And these user stations are what the you know, African people can actually you know, log on to to get on the internet. Uh, first off, with the hub stations, um, to service Africa at the rate we want to service them, we're going to need about 30.5 gigabits per second of total capacity. Um, and this is going to require four hub stations. Um, each hub station is going to have about 8 gigabits per second of capacity. Um, and these are all going to be located in Europe. Um, the reason for this, as uh, Joan hinted at before, is that there's only about 28 gigabits per second of uh, fiber connection actually going into Africa right now. And obviously, a lot of that is already in use. Um, so you know, we need to find a place that's close enough that we can see it from those ge geostationary satellites, but that isn't going to you know, rob bandwidth from applications that are already in place. Um, and you know, we're going to use existing fiber lines to make sure that these things are relatively easy to implement and can be done on a short timeline. Uh, and then just to give you an idea of the hardware that's included in the station, each station is going to have somewhere on the order of a three meter dish, as well as all the supporting electronics, both for you know, the satellite communications and for the back end networking. And you know, all of this technology is available today, and that's to the tune of about $350,000 per station. And you know, it's, it may seem a little strange that you know, we're, a, we're a space systems class, and you know, my, my entire portion of this presentation is going to be about stuff that's on the ground. Um, but you know, there are a couple things that drove us to that. One of them is the technological maturity of the satellite assets. You know, that IP star satellite that Kelly talked about, that's already in service. It's, you know, it's working great. Um, so, you know, by and large, the challenges in space have been solved. We have the technology that we need to do this from a space perspective. But you know, that sort of that frees us up to focus on you know, how can we actually get these into the hands of the people that need them and make sure that this is a technological solution that will meet their unique needs. And a big part of that is we need to shift as much cost as possible away from the end user. So we've got to make these stations as cheap as possible. We've got to stamp them out you know, a lot at a time and make sure that this is, this is something that you know, somebody on a... Um, somebody on a modest income can afford. Um, and that opens up, uh, excuse me, that opens up some new motivations for adoption, um, one of which is uh, this is a great enabling technology for low-cost laptops, such as the OLPC or the Intel Classmate PC. Um, you know, if you take those computers and give them to you know, a school or a hospital, that's great. But if you can do that and put these computers on the internet, the value of that technology skyrockets. Um, another option is microloan financing. You know, much the same way that people in developing regions now will purchase a cell phone and turn that cell phone into a business by charging people to use it and then using, those, using that revenue to pay for their contract and then pocket the profits, we can do the exact same thing with one of these stations. Somebody could purchase a station, operate it out of their home, and charge other people in their um, small town for use of it. And lastly, you know, we're, not, we're not really trying to make any money off of this. This is intended to be a you know, philanthropic effort. And if we can make these user stations very low cost, it's conceivable that somebody would step in and just you know, give them away to the people that could use them. So you know, a few highlights of the user station. Um, and this hits, hits directly with the themes that Joan was talking about before. This is very low cost, only $2,650 per station. And relative to competing technologies, this is, this is dirt cheap. Um, these are all implementable today using existing technology. There's no you know, huge technological problems that still need to be solved. It's all ready to go right now. And that, in turn, makes a system that is very, very low risk. Um, and we've added a couple more things. One of them is the modular power design, which allows us to you know, drop, these stations, drop these stations anywhere and you know, get them powered up and ready to go. So we have um, 
you know, a lot of different options for that so we can adapt to local climates and uh, you know, basically harvest whatever power is there to run this station. And we've also included a, a neat piece of technology that I'll talk about later that will allow this station to be set up and configured with no professional technical intervention whatsoever. So here's a model of our ground station. Um, over here on the left, we have the uh, satellite antenna dish and the, um, the base, because we have to keep the dish very stable to maintain a good lock on the satellite. And in the electronics enclosure, we have the satellite modem, uh, power regulation, energy storage, et cetera. Um, and on the right here is a solar panel, which was the, the, mobile, the, the mobile power generation source that we you know, studied in detail. So first, the uh, data subsystem, and we're going to use regular commercial off-the-shelf satellite communications equipment, and it's VSAT for a very small after terminal. But basically, it's exactly like what you'd see from DirecTV or you know, any sort of satellite television provider. Um, and uh, these stations are each going to have a data rate of uh, 512 kilobits per second down from the satellite and 256 kilobits per second up to the satellite. And that's you know, roughly equivalent to a DSL connection here in the States. Um, and you know, we're going to use a low transmit power because that has a very, um, very direct impact on overall station cost. And uh, once the data is down from the satellite, we're just going to use standard Wi-Fi hardware to distribute this data to the end users. So each one of these, each one of these stations is effectively a wireless hotspot that you can drop anywhere in the world. And we also have a cache system which will sort of mask the effects of the fact that you're on satellite internet. And when we're using a geostationary solution for the satellite leg of this, that satellite is so far away that just the time it takes to transmit the data up to the satellite and then back down to the ground has a significant impact on your quality of service. By caching that data and storing it locally, you can make this connection behave as though it was a regular terrestrial connection, um, even though you're running through a satellite. And you know, again, all of these subsystem components are available today. This is all regular off-the-shelf technology. Um, but the, you know, the revolution here is that we've combined these all into something that's very, very functional. Um, a little more, here's a diagram of our data distribution. Um, so here you've got the satellite link is going to connect down to the user station, which is here in the center. And then all of the computers that are inside this green circle can connect just you know, via a standard um, omnidirectional Wi-Fi antenna like you all have built into your laptops. Um, but you know, as anybody who's been on Wi-Fi knows, the range of one particular hotspot is not, not very big. And so if you were to put that in the center of a village, you're going to have large regions, you know, basically anywhere more than, you know, say, a half a kilometer away from that aren't going to be properly connected to it. So we have a couple of options for that, one of which is a, a directed Wi-Fi card. Um, and these hook up via USB and then basically replace the omnidirectional Wi-Fi antenna that's in your laptop with a directed antenna. So instead of transmitting the information everywhere, it's just going to transmit it in a very particular place. And if you align it correctly, you can get hooked up to, uh, you can get hooked up to this hotspot here in the middle, even though you're three or four kilometers away. Another option that's a little beefier is um, you can set up these point-to-point -point links here on the bottom. And you have a separate reflector dish on each end of this connection. And it basically just relays the Wi-Fi signal. It's the same, same protocol, same everything. You just relay it over this um, much more powerful directed antenna link. And you can push these um, connections up to about 100 kilometers. And there is some technological heritage with this, um, specifically the Invenio system, which I'll, I'll reference in a little bit. But you know, this stuff is already on the ground, and it's already working. Um, and one, one last thing to note is, you know, especially if you're incorporating some of the low-cost laptops like the OLPCs pictured here, it gives you the power to turn any one of these computers that's outside the green circle into another hotspot through mesh networking. So you know, all these computers that are up here on the, on the top right, they're all sharing the connection of this one computer that has the directed Wi-Fi card. And uh, lastly, you know, we, we talk, I mentioned the cache earlier. We'd hook the cache right off the main station here. And you know, what that would allow us to do is you know, if, somebody, if this guy is looking at a very commonly viewed picture or video, odds are good that that video is already stored here centrally. And so he can just access that immediately, and there's no traffic whatsoever running up over the satellite link. You know, that connection behaves as though he was you know, here in the States on a high quality, reliable connection. Um, all right, so now onto the modular power system. Um, again, you know, we want to make these stations. We want to give these stations the ability to deploy you know, anywhere, anywhere in Africa specifically, but also anywhere in the world. And to do that, we want to harvest local power so that we can make them totally independent of any utility infrastructure. Um, the, first, uh, sorry. the first thing we looked at is a solar power unit. Um, and this is feasible over you know, very large areas in Africa. Um, also, we've got wind power. And this says it's cheaper on a per watt basis than solar. But um, only very, very small areas in Africa are able to make use of it. Those are the areas with very high, you know, high speed sustained winds. 
Um, and lastly, kinetic power. And this would be either you know, a human on a bicycle or you know, using some sort of pack animal to turn a crank. Um, yeah, these would be options too, but uh, our research so far indicates that the peak human generating capacity, especially with the kind of crude hardware that you'd find on the ground in Africa, is just not going to get the job done for us. Um, and you know, here on the bottom, this modular design allows us to, to adapt to local resource availability. It's totally independent. You can drop it anywhere, and you don't have to redesign the thing to make it work in multiple places. Here's a map of the different areas in which power systems we think would be best suited for them. Um, in the yellow regions here are have good, reliable connections to the power grid. So you know, obviously, that's a, a cheap, easy way to get these stations hooked up. Um, but then in the orange regions, which is where we focus most of our design, is uh, solar power. Um, lastly, as I mentioned before, the wind power areas, you know, they're mostly coastal, and they're very, very small. You know, there's, there, there's a very small number of areas where wind is actually a viable option to generate enough power for the station. Um, and then this sort of other area here, you know, these people are, you know, are not out of luck, but we just have not yet identified a solution to generate power for them that we can do at a low cost. We could use solar, we could use wind, but all those installations would have to be larger and more costly than the design that we're specking out here right now. Um, so here's an example of uh, our primary power system design. As you can see, it's a solar panel. Um, we also have a battery to store the power. The panel itself is 1.4 meters squared and generates a peak power of just under 200 watts. And then we've sized a battery, and this is just a standard um, car battery sort of technology. So if it needed to be replaced on site, there's a much better chance of there being another car battery around. Um, and we've sized it to provide 10 hours of reserve power. All told, this um, power generating capacity and storage should be able to power, this, power any station in a good solar region for more than 12 hours a day. And that's you know, even in the winter and months when the weather is, is not ideal. And you know, much, the same, much the same as the data system, all these components are available today. There's no big technological leaps here. This is all stuff that's proven on the ground, ready to go. Um, so you've heard about what the station can do, and you're probably curious about how much it's going to cost. Uh, each one of these stations has a hardware cost of $1,825, and that, inc that includes manufacturing. The two main cost drivers for this are the power generation solution over here on the right and the satellite communications. You know, for starters, you know, solar panels are just they're, they're very expensive. We hope that they'll come down in cost, but it's, that's kind of a fixed cost for us. The other um, aspect, the satellite communications, if we attempted to make a station that was more capable, say a station that could transmit multiple megabits per second, that drives the cost of our satellite transmitter hardware up dramatically. And at that point, it's no longer a low-cost solution. Um, and then competing systems, I referenced before the Invenio system. That system costs $5,300, and it can't talk to the satellites. It has to be close enough to use one of those point-to-point -point connections so that you can link it to a regular terrestrial internet connection. Um, and then another system, the BGAN system, this system is able to talk to satellites, but it has no independent power generating capacity. So you, that, you take that $2,400 and you have to add back the cost of our solar panels and our power regulation and our batteries in order to get a solution that has the same capabilities as we're proposing here. And there are also some other non-hardware costs that need to be considered in, in these ground stations, the first of which is manufacturing, which we've estimated to be about $130 per station. And that's roughly 7.5% you know, of your component costs. Um, additionally, taxes and tariffs total out to about $655 per station. Um, and that's a 36% average. To, to compute this number, we looked at the average tax rates over the countries where our pilot programs are located. And that came out to about 36%. Excuse me. But as you can see, the, the tax rates vary widely over the continent. So you know, that cost is going to go up or down depending on which specific country you're trying to get these stations into. Lastly, the, or the transport is about $170 per station. This is you know, by sea, standard shipping container kind of stuff. Um, and again, this is an average over the pilot locations for transport into a major city in that country. And one other thing that should be considered here is there are some import and export restrictions. The, you know, the, the takeaway from this is that if there's anything in the station that can be re-engineered for use as a weapon or something to that effect, the United States government is not very keen on you exporting it. Um, so obviously, that should be avoided if possible. Um, and now, just to give you an idea of how all these costs fit together, um, as you can see, the, the sort of secondary costs make up about 2 thirds of the total station cost. So they're not, they're not insignificant. And you need to consider them whenever you're trying to figure out what the true cost of this station is actually going to be. And all these costs were projected for September 2010, which is when we anticipate that a system like this could be in, in uh, full volume production. So here's, here's that uh, cool piece of technology I was talking about. 
The idea here is that we've put together a package that will allow you to set up the antenna and get the antenna pointed at the geostationary satellite with no professional intervention. And we call it the, the visual positioning package. Um, inside of this unit that's here on the upper left, we have a digital compass and a GPS unit. And those, between those two things, you can find out the orientation of your station, you know, north, north, south, east, west, as well as its position on the Earth. And then it will calculate the three parameters that you need to point the antenna. The first one is shown here, which is the elevation. And that's you know, the angle that you're going to look at up into the sky. And so you can adjust that on the hardware here behind the antenna. And then once that's locked in and ready to go, um, the, the visual positioning package will display your rotational, your, your azimuth, um, excuse me, the azimuth value that you need to be at. And that's you know, rotating the dish around, the, um, around its mounting post so that you have it looking at, in the right direction into the sky. And once that's taken care of, um, you need to you know, sort of turn the dish like a steering wheel in order to properly align it with the, with the trans transmitted waves that are coming from the geostationary satellite. Once the three of those um, parameters have been set properly, you should have some signal from the satellite at that point. And it's just a matter of sort of jiggling the dish around until you get the best lock that you can. Um, and that's you know, shown by the signal meter. And once you're in the green, you are on the internet. Um, so you know, I've been saying you know, there are no technological leaps required. The stuff is ready to go today. Those are not just empty words. We actually have a demonstration that's here on site. It works. It's fully functional. Satellite communications, cache system, Wi-Fi, independent power, the whole nine yards. And you know, if we can do this in eight weeks for $3,000, we're very confident that you know, a team of paid professionals can do this at our price point and in the near term. Um, and you know, just a couple more statistics. You know, the total mass is reasonable for transport, and our cache system is providing a very significant increase in uh, quality of service. So uh, with that, now that you've, oh, and uh, one, one last thing, immediately following this meeting, um, you know, that, as I said, that station is here on campus, and we hope you'll all come down and take a look at it. I believe it's right outside of 42, right, Ryan? 41, sorry. Um, that way. Uh, uh, so now that you've heard about the, both the, the satellite aspect of our system and the ground stations, I'm going to turn it back over to Joan, who will give you some more details about how we're actually going to get this thing deployed and out into the hands of the people that need it. Great. Thanks, Drew. So again, uh, this is like we've been talking about. We have our geostationary satellite, and then we have our user stations and ground to help complete our ground system. So how exactly are we going to deploy this so that you know it's very effective? Um, this is our timeline, taking you know each step by step. So as we've been talking about, we're first going to lease capacity of current existing assets. This is extremely important in that it takes about two years to build a satellite. So this allows us to provide service immediately. In concert with doing that, we're also going to deploy, as I said, the six pilot programs um, to understand the adoption rates, et cetera. Along with those pilot programs, more will continue to be distributed um, based on interest. As Drew talked about, um, kind of the big cost driver of our ground station was the power system. And we believe that in the future, with some redesign of the components on our user station, we can really bring that power down. So this milestone represents that redesign, such that the cost of that user station can come down even more. So this uh, we'll have the redesign here, and then after that, distribute more user stations. Um, and then finally, we'll make the decision as to whether or not to actually launch a geosatellite. Based on the performance of the stations, the adoption rates, et cetera, we really need to make this decision, and as soon as possible, since it does take two years to build that. Now, after we make that decision, phase two, again, will commence with the launch of that satellite. And at this point, we'll continue you know, as many, distributing as many user stations as possible and really watch the market at this point, because the next decision involves whether or not we should launch the second satellite. Now, this is really the attractive part of this phase deployment, because if user adoption rates for some reason are very low and you know, it's not beneficial to have a full capacity system as we have planned out here, you can decide not to launch the second asset and save $200 million in the process. Um, but if the adoption rates are high, then you do make this decision, and then two years later, we'll launch that second asset and have a full capacity system. Now, you're probably wondering, all right, so how much does this whole system cost? Now, as far as a company funding this, if they bought the hub stations, the satellites, the lease cap capacity for two and a half years, that'll be about $435 million. Now, if all the user stations are distributed, 
That'll come to about $110 million, bringing us to a total of $545.2 million. Now, at first, this might seem pretty high if you aren't used to you know, the cost in the aerospace market. However, if you look at just a couple other examples, um, seven Boeing 757's cost on the order of our system uh, same with four F-22 Raptors. And then if you take you know, a step out of the aerospace market, um, just building the Sears Tower in Chicago costs about $950 million. So that just gives you an idea of where we stand with this system. So overall, you know, throughout this entire presentation, we've really presented a system that's low cost, low risk, can be implemented immediately, start serving people now, and is very, very easy to deploy. Now, I mean, this is huge. You know, we can make a large impact on thousands and, excuse me, millions of people's lives, not just thousands. You know, whether it's the farmer who, you know, decides to start growing something new and then can feed his family and, you know, hire 10 full-time workers, or the children who now have a better education because they have better access to information, or the healthcare clinic that now can treat its patients because they have the information of how to do so, or you know, are informed of widespread outbreaks throughout the continent. You know, we really feel that this is something that can change many, many people's lives, and we've laid out a very feasible and business approach to do so. So with that, you know, along with my colleagues here and the students back in Michigan and the University of Michigan, I'd like to thank all of you for listening today. Um, that's all we have, so if you have any questions, um, go for it. So I had, uh, thanks for uh, giving the presentation. I just had a couple of questions. Um, how many users do you anticipate on average would would be using one of the user stations? So I'm trying to get an, a sense for the cost per person. Right. Um, and then the other question is, there seemed to be a big sort of gap in the coverage around Namibia. Is that just because the population den density there is so low that you just, I, I, I noticed you also skipped the Sahara, but just wondering why Namibia, even with the second satellite, there's no coverage there. Well, to answer your first question, um, we have it designed so that each user station is servicing about 150 users. Um, but that's kind of a little bit different because each user represents actually 50 people with the requirements that we were given with our system. Um, but we're also anticipating that all 150 of these users are not using the station at the same exact time. Uh, so it won't be you know, overcrowded with traffic. As far as the coverage goes, let's go to that slide. Were you, talking about, were you talking about the the satellite coverage side or the power the power ma coverage map? The satellite coverage. Yeah, green is. Oh, okay, it's regional beam. I didn't understand that. Right, it's a, it's a shape beam. So these are lower population. I'm sorry. These are lower population density regions. So that we are actually providing coverage there. But um, is it the same level of coverage, or and you're just counting on statistically having fewer users, or is or right? Is it yes. It, so yeah, this is just based on the population there. So we would be, you know, providing like based on our requirements and everything, the same type of coverage um, necessary. But it's just a lower population, so that's why we're using shaped beams for those regions. And what is the cost you're expecting for the uh, bandwidth you're buying in the interim until you launch a satellite? Yeah, another question? Uh, so that's a great question. And probably the biggest problem with space. Oh, sorry. The question was, what is the estimated cost of the bandwidth of the satellites that we will need to acquire? Um, honestly, that's a question we don't have an exa exact answer to. Um, it, it's. No. Until we launch our own satellite? Or the yeah, until. Oh, yeah. until. Yeah, the, the, the first, six, first two years. OK. Well, right now, we have that set at $33.6 million, um, which what goes into that number includes, that's an actual quote from a company of how much they charge per month per data rate. Um, and that number is assuming we start with six user stations, and then we have a growth of 20% per month um, of users. Yeah. 
So in your uh, power system analysis, I noticed that uh, you considered a lot of alternative energies. Why not use a diesel generator or gas generator? It looks like the amount of power you need is small, and small generators are cheap. I mean, that, that's technically, that's, that's certainly a feasible solution, but then you have to deliver gas to the, to the station every couple of weeks. Is there not a, is gas not well supplied in a lot of these areas? It's, uh, it seems like it's a common resource in a lot of the world. It's easily accessible. Um, I mean, my, I mean, this is pure speculation, but my, I would speculate that it would be easier to come by than, than grid, elect, grid utility power. Um, but you know, our, our idea here was that these stations could be set up and sort of left alone without having to, you know, to refill a gas tank um, periodically. Latency for um, geostationary internet uh, connections is generally 600 milliseconds plus. That's a minimum. Correct. Hi, uh, fantastic presentation. I'm wondering if you uh, you presented some case studies of who might be using this as an end user, and um, I think we all working at Google understand the benefits of the internet. Did you do any? directed user studies uh, to find out who actually might be using this and sort of get a demand profile? Or did you, or did you at least look into uh, people who may have done such studies in the past to really look maybe on a country by country or region by region basis what the actual demand might be? Um, we've been working with a couple of people through other schools at the university, um, namely the public health school, the business school, et cetera, that helped us understand that as we're engineers, so we don't have the greatest idea. Um, so um, specifically, this, this woman, Molly Christensen, really gave us a great idea of what people need and what's out there. Um, as far as specifically by country, uh, we haven't gone that close yet. Um, However, it does seem as though that is a, a really focused study that needs to happen in order for this to really take off. Because you know the end user might not want to use a laptop; it might be you know a cell phone that's actually connected to the internet or something like that. Um, one, one other aspect of that is the locations we chose for our pilot programs um, were designed to vary strongly across the three variables that we mentioned. So if you know if per capita GDP or literacy rate really you know, has a strong correlation with adoption, we'll find that out um, with those pilot programs and be able to target our, our future deployments accordingly. Are your power assumptions uh, powering both the PC as well, or just um, just the actual Wi-Fi network and, and the core base station? Uh, currently, it's only designed to power the, the core base station. Um, the OLPCs sometimes ship with, with hand cranks that can be used to power the, the computer itself. But it would, you know, it would require minimal, you know, minimal redesign to oversize the solar panel and you know, suck some of the power off that to power end user electronics. But it would certainly drive up station cost. OK, I guess uh, I'd like to thank you guys all for uh, coming today. And uh, just one more round of applause to the students. <laughs>